What I want to talk about is, uh, to a certain extent, to counter uh, Cathy's presentation and hopefully have a debate, a, a reasoned debate. I'm, I must stress at the beginning that what I'm, what I'm going to say in the second half of this presentation is not intended as criticism. It is intended as a critique, if you like, and there's a, there's a subtle difference between the two. I hope we can have a reasoned, open debate about it without getting acrimonious. That's not my intention, Cathy. Uh, let's see how we go. Okay, uh, waste management in New South Wales, what is going on? Sorry? Okay. Oops, what happened there? Yep. I'm going to go back to 2007, where we had a war strategy. And that war strategy had some great ideas about diverting, uh, preventing uh, and avoiding waste, uh, reco recovering resources, reducing litter and all the rest and put out some targets. It was good stuff and it gave us, I think at the time, a good start, something to build on. In 2014, the strategy was revised, as it has to be. And that revision um, talked about reducing waste generation, keeping materials circulating within the economy as priorities for New South Wales. But overall, what that revised strategy did was increase the targets, and only increase the targets, so there was substantially the same objectives as we, have, as we had in uh, seven years earlier. Well, okay, that's fine, that's the way strategies are written. The important thing is the action plan that backs up the strategy, but that uh, really wasn't uh, so readily available at the time. New South Wales has achieved a lot. A lot has happened. Um, not everyone's going to agree that the achievements have been correct, but a lot has happened, and I think as an industry and as a regulator, as councils, we've all been pulling together generally to go down the same path. We've got a very high waste levy in this state, $141.20 a tonne, $81.30 in, rural, in the regulated, outside the regulated area, uh, which is the highest in the country, and that has certainly created an environment where we can get resource recovery and generate the infrastructure that's necessary for it. To be commended for it, the EPA, or well, the New South Wales Government, has had the Waste Less Recycle More pro program, which has put a, a what, uh, about 300, uh, 350 million, sorry, 750 million odd dollars available for waste programs, waste infrastructure from the levy, put it back into the economy. There are those that argue that uh, we should be putting it all back into, the, uh, into waste. Um, yes, well, we can have that debate in a separate forum. The fact is that the New South Wales government as a percentage is putting more money directly back into waste management than the other jurisdiction. I think they're to be commended for it. The CDS scheme was introduced. I think it was very fortunate that it was introduced when it was because it is giving us a clean product that we could not get from MRFs, and that is to a certain extent abated the impact of China National Sword. And FOGO GO collections and FOGO collections have expanded extraordinarily. So they're, they're really big pluses to my mind. On, there are other innovations, regulatory innovations that have occurred. Some will disagree with them. These are limits on stockpiles. There are good reasons for putting them in. Recently, we have the minimum C&D standards. Uh, some will consider them to be onerous, but they're directed, at, I think, at people who are not playing the game, and you've got to do it. We've got an EFW policy, which uh, my personal view, I think, is a little bit... Um, a little bit extreme. However, there is a policy, there is a framework for going ahead. That's all against the background of the waste strategy and quantified targets. Let's look at the levy history in New South Wales because the levy, the cheapest thing you can do with waste is put it in a hole in the ground. Having the levy is what will drive change, what will drive alternatives. And that charts the data that I've got, which I believe goes right back to when the levy was first introduced in the early 1970s through to today. It's a logarithmic scale because you can't get it all on one piece of paper otherwise. It's been huge. And that's had a corresponding impact on the cost of landfill. I'm benchmarking the cost of landfilling with the published uh, Lucas Heights rate if you or I show up with a trailer full of stuff. Currently, it's about $350 odd dollars a tonne. 
And if you just follow the projection, by 2030, it's going to be just under $500 a tonne. That doesn't mean it will be, but that's what that current projection says. That's a lot of money, and that should, I hope, encourage alternatives. <coughs> In amongst all this, there's been a forgotten review, at least I think it's been forgotten, about uh, waste management in New South Wales. Let me, I want to read this out to you because I think it's salient. There is a continuing tension between direct New South Wales government intervention in waste regulation and letting the market determine outcomes. Some, some stakeholders believe the New South Wales government has been too reluctant to intervene. Many people believe there's now a need for a stronger New South Wales government role in ensuring that good data is on waste is available to help make sound policy decisions more engagement with industry and local government, a more proactive New South Wales government role in strategic waste planning, and incentives and mechanisms so that the best of class technologies and infrastructure emerge from the market. Can anyone remember where that was from? <coughs> I'll take you out of your misery. It was the Richmond Review in 2010. It made a whole series of recommendations on what to do to improve waste. And I won't read them all out individually in the, in the interest of time, but if you look at that table there, and you look at the next table, they're not all been done. And I think that's a real shame. Because the, the, uh, the answers to what we need to do to improve waste management, improve resource recovery, landfill diversion, they've actually been on the table for a number of years. And we seem to have had, had reviews and strategies and whatever, <laughs> then we put it on the shelf and don't worry about it until the next time comes around. There's a couple of points in there which are really, really important. Particularly, let me pull out targets. That review, 2010, that's nine years ago, said there should be annual targets for diversion of MSW, CNI and CND waste. Having five-year targets is all very well, but you don't measure your progress. And if you don't manage against incremental targets, it's very unlikely that anything will ever be achieved. And guess what? They haven't been achieved. The need for transparent and open waste data was highlighted at the time. We all know about it. It's been mentioned often in this conference. We don't have it. The State of Waste report that came out, I think it was last week or the week before, quotes, I, understand, I haven't even looked at it, but I was told it was 2014 data, five years old. That's, that's just not right. That's just not the way to manage it. Infrastructure to handle Sydney's waste. There are 95 sites handling CND waste, 25 handling CNI, three MBT plants, five in total in New South Wales. We've got one big anaerobic digester for source separated food waste, 47 other organics processing facilities, and one MRF dedicated to the production of process engineered fuel. That's a pretty good bag of infrastructure. But is it ad hoc? Organics, that's the organics, the map of organics recovery in New South Wales by local government areas in 2011. Good, tick, a lot was happening. Not everybody had a, a green waste bin, let alone a FOGO bin. Compare it to today, and there's been a remarkable improvement. And I think that's to everyone's credit in local government that that's been carried through. Pity it hasn't been greater in Sydney. There are lots of reasons for it. Won't go into them here. But there's certainly a lot more room for improvement, a lot more that can be done there. We've had some monumental failures too, haven't we? Who remembers the swerf down in Wollongong? And unfortunately, Arrow Bio down at Spring Farm or Jack's Gully. Both great ideas, they had tremendous potential, they were gonna change the world and they were big lemons, they just didn't happen. Shame. But it's part of the learning, if you like. Waste in New South Wales, this is the latest data I could find at the time that I prepared this, this uh, graph, um, the levy's gone up and up and up, waste diversion has gone up and up, but it seems to have stalled. I can't comment any further because I don't have the current data, but if you look at that trend there, you could be forgiven for thinking it's flatlined and we're not making any progress. That's why the data's important. So, what are the issues today with waste management? Come back to the data. There is no up-to-date set of waste data that's publicly available that tells us all where we're going and gives us that critical feedback on policy changes and technology implementation. There's no comprehensive list of infrastructure that's publicly available. 
we need to have a gap analysis to look at what will be needed if we're going to achieve these targets, what infrastructure is needed to achieve those targets, process that waste, do the resource recovery, and most importantly too, where are you going to put it? There needs to be a plan for it. I said that waste less, recycle more is a great big tick, and it is. But I'm wondering, was that ever supported by an integrated infrastructure plan? Or have we just been spending the money on what's a bright idea at the time? Um, future landfills need to be included. No matter how much resource recovery we do, if we burnt everything, we're still going to need to do something with the ash. There's always going to be a need for landfills. You can't burn asbestos. And guess what? Technology will break down. Something will happen. The plant will stop, if nothing else, for regular maintenance. But the waste keeps coming in the door. You've got to have landfills to manage that, to manage disasters, and to manage the stuff you can't burn. We need a landfill plan. Um, the planning process itself, we've been speaking about this also in the conference, is too cumbersome and lengthy for waste management facilities. That needs to be improved. The industry's been saying that for a long time, but it doesn't seem to be occurring. The use of glass, again, we talked about that yesterday. Glass used in civil construction is really a no-brainer. It couldn't be simpler. <coughs> Why isn't it happening? What is, the, what is the reason for the inertia behind us actually getting on and doing it? China National Sword. The response, yes, there is a response. I'm not saying there isn't, but it's been awfully slow. I, I was told about the, uh, the Coca-Cola initiative to, pot, to bottle all Franklin uh, mineral water in recycled PET bottles. Great, wonderful. But if you dig a little bit deeper, all that recycled PET is imported. What on earth is going on? Why can't we source it locally? Why isn't the investment being made into that infrastructure? Um, we need low, robust logical targets that are based on facts and not politics. Question, should those targets be mandated? Have we gone far enough? If we're not achieving them, is there now a case to mandate the targets and have something like in the UK with a LAD scheme, if you don't do the diversion, then you pay on top of the levy? It's a question. I haven't got an answer. Commercial food, commercial food organics needs a driver. It's not happening either. There's all sorts of problems with collecting the food waste. Uh, it's not the same economics. Maybe it should be integrated into the MSW system. Let's stop playing around with it. Let's just get on and do it. Energy from waste, I mentioned that earlier. In my view, the policy actually inhibits the development of energy from waste facilities. And unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation out there in the community about what modern incineration facilities do and what their impact is. And now we come to the second half of the presentation, MWU. In amongst all these problems, we're now shutting down the AWT industry. I think that's a serious issue for the, for the overall performance of our landfill diversion and for the for business confidence in future investment in resource recovery in New South Wales. As Cathy mentioned, there are five plants processing, MS, processing MSW in New South Wales. They process around half a million tonnes a year, divert roughly 320 odd thousand tonnes a year from landfill. Capital investment in the region of $300 million. All of that required banking. The financiers who aren't in the room right now the bankers, the guys with the money, they only are interested in how secure is their investment. There's got to be regulatory certainty to encourage those investments. Otherwise, with limited capital, the money will most probably go to Queensland or Victoria, which is fine for Queensland and Victoria, but New South Wales is also on the, on the map trying to do something. And all those things in uh, the MWU plants, in the MSW plants, is supported by a network of council contracts which are now left sort of stranded, or risk being left stranded. So what's the history of MWU? Cathy gave a, a brief description. Let me try and flesh it out from my point of view a little bit. In 2006, the EPA expressed misgivings about the land application of what was at the time called AWT Organics or Outdorf. MWU is great. It's all MBT organics. <coughs> I think that was a slightly inverted approach. Firstly, we encouraged 
the development of these facilities and then we questioned the product application. There's a logical problem with that, but that's what happened. It is, it is what it is. In 2007 to 9, there was a study undertaken, which I had the pleasure of leading, that was funded by the New South Wales, Victorian and WA environmental authorities and also industry. The total budget was only $350,000. It was very much just a toe in the water to look at chemicals of concern in the AWT organics, chemicals that were not covered by the biosolids guidelines. So I didn't look at heavy metals, but I did look at all the pesticides, plasticizers, and all the rest of it. That study concluded there was no ecological danger provided by this stuff, provided that the application rate was controlled. And that was the origin of the 10 tonnes per hectare, as I understand it. Because the most, the the chemical that we discovered that gave the biggest problem was the DHP plasticizer, and you could control that with a one-off application to land, provided it was under 10 tonnes per hectare. That was below the theoretical ecological limit that could be found, that we were able to discern. There was also a, obviously a need for further work, and that's where the EPA's ongoing program arrived from. The EPA commissioned further research. As I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there was, at the beginning, limited industry consultation, but subsequently secrecy. In October this year, the TAC report was released. Uh, October last year, rather, the TAC report was released. The authors, however, were not identified, nor were the terms of reference. And the research reports themselves appear not to have been peer-reviewed and were not released, with, uh, not released for public comment. <coughs> I don't understand that. Um, I don't understand how it's possible to make such a monumental decision, which is fundamentally important, I agree, without having complete transparency of the reasons behind it. The resource recovery and exemption orders, an order was uh, rescinded, pending further work, and that's where uh, Cathy has given the EPA's response to that and what's going further forward. Let me say that if MWU presents a hazard to the environment or human health, there's absolutely no doubt that its application has to be restricted and stopped. I'm not, I'm not on about that at all. But the hazard should be scientifically, independently <coughs> assessed and then peer reviewed. And I don't believe that that's correctly happened. The process should be transparent so that we can all see it and all have the ability to, have a, to, to make our, form our own views and understand what's going on. In view of the contractual, legal, financial obligations that are surrounding this stuff, there should be open and off and regular consultation with industry. And I think industry should have been afforded the chance to review that data, review that information, and respond to it with technological changes, potentially. And only if those technological changes could not be implemented, then there should be uh, regulatory action. We've been putting MWU to land for 18 years. There's been no reported damage, and there is time for more consultation. The upshot, I think, is that resource recovery in New South Wales is likely stalled. There's now a sovereign risk for investors. And the regulator, the, the dialogue between industry and the regulator, I, I believe, is a little bit uncertain. And that's going to make implementing a circular economy, which is going to be hard anyway, it's going to make it all that much more difficult. What are the lessons? To stress, the issue is not about the decision to ban MWU. The problem is the way that decision was arrived at. And I think that, that really deserves to be, uh, to be addressed. Resource recovery in, in a circular economy is going to require a partnership between industry and the government. If we adopt, if we wind up in a them and us type of situation, nothing's going to be delivered. We're going to be back here next year, come back here in 10 years, and we're going to be having exactly the same discussion. The objective should be to have an integrated provision of an essential service, waste management, that protects human health above all, protects the environment, manages resources, creates economic opportunity, and creates jobs. And what's needed is recognition of waste as a major contributor to the economy, workable, consistent joint uh, policy framework, consistent, streamlined planning and an open dialogue. Going forward, what are the top eight problems I see that need to be addressed urgently? 
A national waste policy that means it and has teeth. Harmonise levies and regulations nationwide so that we, we can, I mean, from a New South Wales perspective, we've got to stop that interstate transport of waste. I was told that uh, if Waste to Queensland gets shut down by the Queensland levy, the next step is going to be waste going down to Victoria because rural Victoria's got a lower levy. I don't know, that's just gossip that I heard. Reinvestment of the levy funds in industry, well, yes, tick. Regulatory reform to foster infrastructure investment. We need the data and we need an, an infrastructure plan. We can't keep delaying and not putting it out and not having it accessible. It's been going on now for years. When are we going to get the data right? Government leadership in sustainable procurement, that comes back to glass and all the rest of it. Strong and broader product stewardship schemes and EPR schemes, that involves the federal government obviously. And a I would suggest a national proximity principle and mutual recognition to try and get over this levy imbalance and the interstate transfer of waste. And I'd also recommend that we have a look at the Richmond recommendations. There was some good stuff there which has not been fully implemented and I don't see the point of having another review, another go around the merry-go-round. The stuff is there, let's just get on with it. Thank you very much. Any questions?